There goes YouTube. Lettles Jello Spoons. Welcome to Truth, Love, and Peace, episode number 51. I am here with Joe Pizzolatto. Boy. Thank you so Boy. much for joining me. Dude, how uh, How are you? I'm great, man. Hell I'm yeah. Great. I'm hell excited that I could, you know, we could make it happen today. And Me too. Versus Mother Nature. Yeah. We're currently looking at. Yeah, it only took 20 minutes for me to plug everything in today. Okay, so rough. And uh, Mother Nature is bearing down our throats, which is pretty funny. We'd spin that around, but the camera doesn't want to, and the people at home listening can't hear it anyway. So, fuck it! I like it. But uh, welcome to Pensacola Storms. Uh, it's Storm rolling. Storm chasing edition. It's ro Yes, we are chasing storms from the parking lot of Everman's. Uh, so if the storms don't come to us, we will not be good chasers. <laughs> um, but, you know, that guy will. Look at her go. Look at her go. And the forerunner. <laughs> yeah. They got antennas and everything. They're definitely going to go chase a storm. <laughs> Looks wonderful. Looks wonderful. So uh, thanks for, for joining us and on Facebook. Spread the word if you want to hang out. Uh, all that good stuff. What does that say? Robbie Holder. Love you too, brother. Uh, all good. So... Uh, the last time we hung out was for the Big Jam Space Drivers, yeah, probably mashup, super blowout, coming out of the closet, whatever you want to call it, shindig at Shizuko's. Mm -hmm. It was fucking awesome. So you play guitar with Shea White and yeah, probably. Yeah. And uh, Jonathan Ashley and Quentin Ayers. Um, and what did you do before that? Um, well... So, I mean, I've always kind of, I mean, long story short, after high school, mm -hmm. I played full-time. Um, you know, as they say, you make your first bit of real money gigging when you do some reggae. Played reggae, <laughs> played reggae for a little bit right I've here. never heard that. Who says yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, just maybe some more of the locals, at least in this this area. I like uh, it. But, yeah, um, you know, took a little break, and really between, after once I left, I went to college for a little bit, and once I got back out, that's when I kind of started um, joining some more full-time band so really it's been you know everybody from the industry I've played with Hotel Oscar uh, played a little bit with Buku Groove um, and oh Okaloosa Sound you play with Okaloosa Sound nice uh, yeah so it's, it's been a you know over a I'll just say a six year period probably about shit what feels like five or so different bands you know <laughs> Um, that's good. That's yeah, good man. Work. It, it, that's well, you know, it's it's the scene. It's it, it's a little bit of the scene that's down there, down here, and you know, just just the fact that everybody knows each other. You just kind of do your thing, bounce yeah. around, have your fun with it. So, so yeah, that that's kind of the main roster. And right now, yeah, probably, definitely one of the funnest bands I've played with. You know, Shay, Quentin, Phil. It's a really it's a really cool dynamic I'm glad we got to do that show I'm really glad that we got to do that with them because it was cool to see I heard about Big Jam Space Driver and finally seeing them together was, was pretty badass yeah, it's pretty you special know, yeah, yeah it's it, it pretty was, special it was awesome it was killing and then now there's this other on on the horizon stand back with Lee Yankee and oh yeah everybody. you know I finally met him yeah. The first time. Well, I mean, cool. passing. Well, I met him pass and passing one time before, and then uh, that was a Ben Jernigan's birthday party. Yeah. And then um, he actually played a gig with this. With yeah, probably uh, what was it? Shit, I think it was a s Sunday, Saturday. I don't know. I actually sat in with John Hart the, earlier that day. I got there a little late, so Lee was there already playing. And. That was when I finally was like, what's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Handshake, you know. Uh, but I, I had not heard much about the... June 29th, check it out. Owen was telling me all about it when, when we were catching up. It's uh, it's a, another awesome project that's going on. Uh, a lot like what you guys are, are doing. It's fucking, fucking very cool. Yeah. The... So, how did you meet Shay? I just double back. How did you meet all those guys? And, and yeah, probably I'm sure through the scene. But what was going on when all that went down? Because you were, we were talking before this fired up about Moe's mm. uh, being down the road. Yeah, Moe's is kind of. Where does he fit in that picture? Uh, well, I joined uh, Hotel Oscar. It, the lineup at that point was obviously Moe's, Isaac, and uh, Quentin. Mm -hmm. So you know, from there, uh, you know, we played probably together for about nine or ten months maybe somewhere in there and uh 
and yeah, so with with that, then actually to add one more band to the first question, which is that then branched off into most Wilson and Delta Twang. Mm-hmm. So I was doing that thing for you know, I'm still doing it. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, going up to record with Mose and Isaac in Nashville oh. Monday and Tuesday. Yes, that's gonna be great. Um, but yeah, so then from there, I've been doing my own thing and whatever, blah blah blah. And then Quentin and I just we touched base and we just got to talking and. Play guitar because at that point I've been playing, you know, still been playing guitar and playing a lot of, you know, still playing actually more bass. Uh, but long story short, he just we got to talking and he was like, "Hey man, just come out and jam." Actually, he sent me a recording. I played on the recording and I just sent it back and he was like, "All right, here are all these gigs." And I was like, "Cool." Yeah, and, and it just went great. great. Yeah, man. And I and and we get along and it's a smooth transition because you know working with Mo's or. Or even Quentin, you know, I'm, I'm, those players know that I'm a parts player and I like parts and I write my parts and you know it's the the commutative property of actually being in a band and making you know if it's two to five, ten, twelve people, just how good can we make it sound? So working with Quentin and him, just the first bit of work, if you will, was just like record something on this. It's like yes, yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. gladly, yeah, so, yeah. And Quentin's always got something new for me to listen to. That's what everything. One of the things oh, I love about guy. seeing him. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah, you know, he'd be like, dude, check this shit out. Oh yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> play, play, what you got? What you got? Play. Yeah, because that's how I find new music. Is people oh, yeah. like Quentin. Like I don't ever hear new music if it's not for somebody like Quentin in my life. Right, right. Yeah, there's a little bit of footwork that comes with it because I actually have Apple Music with the family share, and mm-hmm. I had, I think he put like six people on there, and I was like, dude, I need people to. So I put. <laughs> <laughs> I, put, I put Quentin and a few other homies on there. It's like well, the only stipulation, the only stipulation. If you don't want to kick you off here, just share music with me, because you, you can just send it in a text and it just pops up right there in the text. Cool, it's perfect. So I'm just flinging shit out left and right, and then I finally, you know, I, I started pushing him. He started doing it more. So that alone, just his mind of what he's listening to, it's a really cool, um, you know, opposite sides of the same thing. You know if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's really badass. That's neat. I need to get in something like that. Oh man, it's it's an addiction, for sure. That sounds super sweet. Yeah. Fuck yeah. So we were in a tornado a minute ago, and now I guess it's look, fine. What did I say? <laughs> yeah. I did say this shit would be gone, and who knows how long. Now we just basically missed the sunset. That was it. We were in a storm, and then we and just. That's the only reason the I sunset. wanted to do this because I wanted to be with you, watching a suns- sunset. It was. Yeah, I. That's what it I was still do. magical, Joe. It was still <laughs> magical. I promise. Uh, what was that story you told about the kill of that? You were like, check under there. That chick just took a kneel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. just popped in my head for some reason. Like that, I finally got to do it. Just took a kneel. I was like, just check, bro. Just yeah. Check it out. Just reach up there and find <laughs> out. Uh, that's one of my favorite jokes. The the punchline to that is that uh, we were both shocked. Me at, at her, yeah. at how sweaty my nuts were, and me at how little self respect she had. <laughs> <laughs> to get her knees dirty. And, <laughs> and you know she just kept partying. You know she just went on the rest of her night. And just oh yeah, her girlfriend was fine with it. Like it was. Oh girl, okay. Nice. Well, in one version, like there, it's happened so many times. <laughs> in one version. Like that. Yeah, when you say it's happened so many times, that makes it sound really. Like, oh man, I feel like, like people dirty. should be paying you. I know, right? And then uh, you need to you <laughs> getting paid. <sighs> and then the question is, do I? Well, there is. You, you, you walk. That's the clear line of self-respect. Do I want to get paid for people taking a knee and reaching up my? Yes, yes, I do. I think my junk is is worth. If you're gonna touch it, Good. you owe me money. Then all right. Yeah. Like, then that's <laughs> declared. Everybody yeah. on the internet knows now. Yeah. If if you <laughs> like if you're not one of those people that I say I love you to on a regular basis, don't fucking touch me. And if you do, it's gonna cost you money. Exactly. Like I'm okay with that. Those are pretty decent rules. That's good. As my buddy puts it, I don't kiss you good night. <laughs> That's even better. There you go. I don't kiss you good night. Well, he's, he taught me. He's he's always saying some funny shit like that. He's like, man, he's like I don't kiss you good night. I'm like, all right, man. <laughs> you're right. Oh, that's a way better way to say that. It is, and it's just the. You know, cut dry. After somebody says it, you're like, all right, fuck it. I guess we're done here. <laughs> yeah. Two motherfucking shake. Right. I like it. I like it. Unlike the storm, fucking disappointment. Yes. Yeah, living in Florida. I was really looking forward to the cacophonous 
rainstorm oh, on yeah. the car so we could go back and listen to it and Feel go like we're interested oh that's art. cool or that was the dumbest idea ever <laughs> like worst podcast in history middle of a rainstorm tin roof fuck it <laughs> <coughs> Quentin's house got a tin roof on it nice house good uh, I'm just I was telling him getting ready to move in I was like man I just better get used to this man fucking tin roof you just don't have good service like the nope. service is horrible yep wherever you go yep What's uh, out in the woods? Out in the woods, we tried everything, man. An antenna outside, like all re- you know, repeating towers, and no nope. tin roof. Just nah. it's like a force field for. Oh, cell it'll phones. cut it off. Yeah, it's fucked. If you want to put somebody in fucking isolation, room, just put them in a room with the tin roof mm-hmm. and a cell phone, so they're actually pissed because they don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's the torture part of it. <laughs> It's been uh, it's been a fun day. I'm trying to remember if there was anything else we were talking about before we got on, before I turned everything on that uh, that I wanted to revisit. Mm. Probably just some random rambling and that these guys have been putting food on the tables since '73. Oh yeah! Shout out to Everman's. Thanks for coming to choose your parking lot. The unofficial sponsors of Truth, Love, and Peace, episode 51, Everman's in Pensacola. Uh, they kindly donated this parking spot for us to chill in. Uh, can't so, you know, they've been putting hey, your food on the table since 73. That's the main part. That is something we were talking about, though, is uh, gardens and community gardens. And uh, you know Sean Peterson, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was telling me a lot about uh, catching me up on the local local gardening scene. Mm. And uh, he actually has a garden. Uh, I have neither a garden nor a green thumb. So... <laughs> Uh, mad props to Everman's have been doing it for 50 years. Right, right. Yeah, their garden over here is looking luscious right next to the, uh, the charge port for your fancy electric cars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, that's. I don't know if they actually go out there. there. <laughs> I don't know if they actually go out there and pick shit from that or they're just like making it look really good. It's probably just aesthetics. Yeah. You would think. But. That's what we were talking about, urban farming and uh, okay. agriculture and the, the future of all that. Mm. I'm on a fakeness. Do you, uh, do you indulge in, in the solving of world problems late at night at the bar? Just like a one-on-one conversation or just... Uh, oh, yeah, you know, like when it comes up. Like, how are we going to feed all the Ethiopians? Oh, uh, that, that okay. still needs to be Yeah, no, in a case like that... Is that South Park reference still relevant? <laughs> Sorry, it's been a while. <laughs> I think if somebody were to open up with that kind of question, I would probably just walk away and uh, <laughs> and just kind of let it coast from there. Because I feel like if I'm at a bar, it's it's like if I'm at a bar, all right, I, the last, I don't really want to talk about music at a bar. I will. I will. But it's something that's so still, it's, it's still so opinionated. Just as if, you know, sometimes talking music can be talking politics with somebody, you know, and in my opinion my opinion I stand beside that because you know definitely if you're fucked up at a bar and talking to somebody about hey man what, what you know a viewpoint a perspective I think it, I think for the something for that to like even equal out would take us understanding like oh okay cool I don't know next topic you know what mm-hmm. I mean like just to be able to say like hey man we're cool let's move on like if somebody did ask me like hey man so, uh, I know it's your shit house, I'm shit house. Um, what do you think about, uh, you know, urban gardening? I'd be like, that'd be a topic. That'd be a topic I'd totally rail into. I'd be like, fuck out, dude. But, I don't know, that just kind of popped up in my head throughout conversations. I have like little pinpoints. So I'll be like, see, we should focus on the conversation to be like, okay, cool, that's your opinion. Groovy, right on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because. That that to me is more of a, uh, a, a, a what what do I call it? What do I always look at it? Because when I'm having a conversation, you know, I'll kind of walk with it, and if I see that it's just kind of fading, I'm just like, ah, you know, all right, well, you know, have a good one, man. Your opinion's your opinion. I'll, I'll check you later. Like somebody like Moses or Quentin, dude, we'll just talk about something for like <laughs> eight hours, and we're hammered. We've been hammered for ten. You know what I mean? So that that's uh, I don't know. I guess it's. Depends on the bar. Let's just say that. Depends on the bar. Mm. Like Chizukas, I would do it. 
I would have that conversation with anybody, really. Yeah. At Chizuka. I think they're kind of the same conversation. They're just different ends of it. Exactly. That makes sense. And depending on how you approach it. Because, you know, feeding people that don't have food becomes the solution that the economic gains from growing food locally can produce. You tie those two things together pretty pretty quickly. Right. That's true. It's very true. I'm big into the, the petrol dollar, like keeping up with what's going on in, in, in the world stage, like with yeah. all this trade in oil and fossil fuels and climate change. And, right. And I'm fascinated by all the ways that we could do it better, but for some reason we don't. Yeah. Like, what's going on there? Man, I had a I had a period in my life where for like a year and a half, it was just so upsetting. I was like, I kept thinking about those big topics and I was like, man, I'm yeah. upsetting myself. Like <clears throat> the, the the messed up part is like I can do things about it, but you know, you just want that immediate, you know, I mean, you wish you could just clean it up just like that, but mm-hmm. It's just as if you look at it like, you know, when somebody flicks it. This is how I say it. Somebody flicks a cigarette butt, right? Mm-hmm. Or trash, whatever. Something's on the ground. And they're like, yeah, man, you know, that, that, that doesn't really matter. It's like, well, I, well yeah, it does. Like, if you, bra- if, if you break it down as far as a human existence, at least on this planet, I mean, well, I've only been here for a few seconds, you know. Mm-hmm. So think about how quick that is. But it's just like with thinking about it on a worldly scale, like you said, whether it's trading or or agricultural whatever it is like I feel that if it's if it's taken to a point where sorry, that guy <laughs> I'm sorry he made me laugh he's walking straight in <laughs> uh, he made it he made a clutch catch he, he juggled some keys and good he, on him yeah yeah that, that caught me off guard um so yeah so if you look at it like like I said with agriculture or whatever you know in this in the grand scheme of things it's kind of like the not eating an elephant whole, but, you know, that whole thing got to me with, you know, the, even I got picked up a canister of oil today at Walmart, and this old dude was like, man, I can't believe you did that. I was like, well, I appreciate it. I mean. Why would I not? Yeah. So, if, sorry if that takes it off topic. That no, 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 no. Me, but, um. It's quite right. Anyway, so, yeah, that's, that's how, um, and, and, and I guess in that whole time scheme of like a, a year and a half, I was just like, man, what do I do? How do I go about this? Like, I want to help. And uh, you're young and you're like, yeah, fuck yeah. How do I? You know, this is all I'm doing. Like, ah, uh, how? How do I solve this, this my problem? Mel, it's my young Mel Gibson moment. I'm just like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Young Mel Gibson moment. <laughs> I don't even know. But, yeah, so, well, I mean, what do you think about that? What do you think about the whole looking at it like that as far as like really well I've been here for so long I've been here for a few seconds maybe let's say five eight seconds uh I I wonder about what it is that that we are in relationship to that timeline Mm -hmm. because definitely whatever this little two-legged version of meat suit is has only been around for about two million years in some version right in the most evolved versions 80,000 years unquestionably every bit as smart. Probably stretch that to about 130, 140,000 years and people were every bit as smart as us. Right. For the most conservative people that are still catching up, like fully mar- modern, couldn't distinguish them walking through Everman's over here would be 40,000 years ago. <laughs> so that gets us down to blink of the eye and what it is that homo sapiens are doing and human beings are doing and whatever we are that's that's running around but is that really what our consciousness is and I am more and more suspect as to individuality I think individuality is a manifestation within this little version of physics that enables a piece of consciousness to protrude into this little version of physics from something else, which is not a new idea. That's ancient philosophy that comes from Hinduism and, and a lot of other versions of yeah, mythology. Yeah, yeah. So, I think whatever that is that everything is a part of is way older than whatever humanity is doing, right. and is probably more associated along the lines of fungi, uh, like what fungi have been up to, because they've been here a lot longer than we are, 
everything pretty much is descended from fungi, plants, animals, DNA. You know. So uh, what do you think about um, to throw this in with mm-hmm. it? So what about like being? It's kind of like the whole recycle theory, right? Mm-hmm. So what about like star matters? Things from outside the planet. Oh yeah, recycle yeah, yeah. straight up. Okay, cool. like constantly Just, yeah. recycling shit. Right. Because that's part of the the system. Uh, it scales up on every level. I was listening to um, five the Book of Five Rings. You familiar, uh, Doctor? Not Doctor. Samurai Ronin Miyamoto Musashi in 1640 mm-hmm. wrote this book. He was he was the, the great samurai. Like you hear about these these rogue. He was top dog. He he literally was the top dog. Uh, killed like 60 plus people I think recorded in samurai duels mm. uh, the master when it comes to it and um, and even he talks about how knowing the way broadly uh, and what it is to understand the systems of of learning and how so as above so below that's that's cool I need to read that book yeah Dude, it's it's a it's a great one. It's a great one. The Book of Five Rings. How long ago did you read it? Well, like how? Oh, I first got a hold of it when I was a kid. Oh, okay. Because uh, I started studying martial arts when I was like I don't know, eight or nine, and uh, Japanese martial arts because of the the samurai and the shogun and the intertwining of politics. Right, you get right. this honor culture thing, and then yeah. you get into philosophy, and so Eastern That's philosophy. And I mean, I'm a huge fan yeah. of all that. Fucking G.I. Joe ever since uh, fucking Snake Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to be a ninja. And then that led Snake me into all eyes. kinds of Japanese right, culture right. shit. And so that, that, that got me to the, the philosophy of of all that fun it stuff. It really is me. deep. I have a friend that studies martial arts. Mm-hmm. And he's third or fourth degree black belt. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's really, he's very in tune with it and loves it. You know, you can tell that just from when he explains it. Mm-hmm. So... He's kind of yeah. giving me bits and pieces that have even fueled me, you know, because I've always loved martial arts films. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know. So I guess, you know, it's kind of like the same thing from if I didn't play music, I feel like I would be a huge listener. You know, same thing with that whole uh, with samurai and that, the whole theory, I think, is really beautiful. You know, it's really fucking cool just to yeah. listen to it, read into it. But this is a homie of mine that would just give him more drinks and he'll just tell you all about it. You're like, <laughs> yeah, man. Putting a cord in the jukebox, I think. Yeah, I feel like that sometimes too. But to bring it back to music, it is the mastery of a skill. It's learning to speak a language. It is a mm. proficiency it's and an expertise. Language, in my opinion. In a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Because it has to do with being physical and, and surviving. And... Holy shit. See what I'm saying? Motorcycles, look out for them. They need you to pay attention. Yeah, she just didn't care at all. Yeah. Crazy things going down, and I'm getting distracted. Yeah, everyone's It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy out here. Watch out for motorcycles. Please. Um, but yeah, that ties back into the original flow state. You know, and, yeah. and learning a language proficiently enough to forget it and then do something. Which is very much what you do on a guitar. I, or at least how I can conceive of playing music on the on the highest levels. Any art form in its highest level, even yeah. sport or anything else, requires an absence of mind at some point. Man, I was thinking about that today. That's really cool you mentioned that. Like, I was just cruising and thinking about, you know, I've had people like, you know, like, man, you're so into it. You're really, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And it's really cool because at least the way that I could explain it is... You know, when I was a kid, I started playing a lot of guitar. It was like I would get this like numb, tingly feeling in the in the front of my head. You know, I just get so into it, and everything would disappear. And as I've gotten older, it's almost like I can walk up to it. You know what I mean? So it's like this. If I had to say, take all this away, there's like this dot, and there's a lot of character and emotions that come up to that point in which you're saying, okay, cool, I'm ready to like totally open up on this instrument. And do what I want to do, and there's sometimes you're like, you know what I mean? Like it's like you're, I'm trying to figure out this energy right now. You might be going through stuff or whatever, but yeah. you know, 
if somebody were to ask me that who doesn't play but just loves music, it's like you're really you're doing your best to tap into something like a signal flow uh, and energy, and that's cool. It's just so ironic that you mentioned that because I was thinking I was just cruising, just like man, what the you know, space. Well, it, that goes back to like I was saying earlier. I think other people figured this shit out. Shit, figured this shit out a long time ago, and uh, and we're all just kind of catching up. And in a lot of ways, modern science is catching up to um, to what's been what people who sat around and thought about it uh, long enough figured out a long time ago. Yeah, like, yeah. You know the the story of the Buddha is a good one. Uh, you know the story of Jesus is is a good one. You can pick any prophet. And one of the things they all have in common is this retreat into education yeah. on, on some level and then becoming enlightened, you know, becoming, uh, you know, better, arisen, anointed, mm-hmm. whatever terminology you want to use. And, and a lot of that just comes from It's a disassociate. Yeah, yeah. It's an experience to learn how to disassociate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> and sometimes it's definitely easier than others, but, you know, that's, and that's, that's the thing is like, you know, and I forget it sometimes too. But if you're playing music, you have to look at it like a lifestyle. Like something's pissed you off, don't be pissed about it, and then go play the gig and be pissed. Because I've done that, and it ruins the gig. You know what yeah. I mean? Take that energy and put it into that. Yeah. And it's unless you live like that, where just music is the main meat and potatoes of of your life. You know, some people might not do that, but I feel like that's a key link in the chain to make it a constant to write if you want to be a writer if mm-hmm. you want to like say I want to be great at this style or I want to write a whole album or I just want to write songs like it has to be a, a, that like I said that link in the chain with everything but but I, I mean hell that goes with anything right I mean yeah you know it's, it's I mean I don't think it's just music alone I know you could probably I mean hell martial arts for example mm-hmm Part of that process, the, yeah. the you have to learn all the rules so you can forget them. Right, right, yeah. Like um, I read this really. <laughs> that's not really nerdy right now because I don't usually read up on stuff like this. But this dude put out. A, a, I just stumbled across it. He was like, "Hey, if you get the time, read this um, blog or whatever it was uh, or article about pick dynamics. You know, like how to hold a pick and this and that. And you know, when it comes down to like Benson technique and uh, blah blah blah." Um, and it was cool because, like, I can't even remember the teacher's name, but uh, old school guitar teacher was just like, hey, you know, there would be a point in which you have to, like you said, you have to, if you want to get speed, for example, you'll reach a point where you're like, wow, I can't go any faster because of my technique. So then you have to just kind of hand the rebuild back up. Mm-hmm. But obviously, you know, just like a callus, man, it just makes it kind of almost easier to endure, you know? Mm-hmm. So those are bump into something, you know, like, I would imagine, you know, if you're practicing the dojo and, like, bloody knuckle after bloody knuckle or whatever the case may be of just consistency, then it's, like, this breakthrough moment. And then digesting what you've already been through just becomes just like that, you know? Yeah. Because sometimes that looking back, you're like, oh, shit, well, what if I, what if I forget to do this? You know, then I'm like, oh, man, I might not be, you know, where I'm at, but... Like, oh, it's right there all along. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. could I not see that for so long? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, man, that's cool. That's badass. What's well, one of those things that, it, since everything is connected, it um, it's just part of life. I think it comes up pretty naturally in in the course of things. But like you said, you know, having to deconstruct and reconstruct things, that's that that goes right back to what Miyamoto said, Musashi said about uh, once you learn how to learn, then everything becomes easier then yeah. you can master anything once once you master mastery you know then, then yeah. you can go and apply that formula to so many other things yeah because it's a flow for sure mm-hmm. I mean the you know I mean I remember starting to play more bass it was just like I was pl- I was practicing a lot of guitar you know what I mean so it just was like oh cool like you're eager you're just open you're like yes yeah you're like a kid <laughs> yeah. new toys yeah exactly new toys that's I wanna play why I just I always do that. If you see me explain something, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what is wrong with this dude? I'm just do it. If you were to just fast forward to a conversation, I'd probably just do it. Like, jazz hands the whole time. I like playing with new toys too, though, especially in, in the thought experiment, like in those aha moments, the, mm-hmm. the revelation. Just like, oh, fuck yeah, man. Look at, look at 
play with this, play with this thing for a little while. Oh yeah, it's always neat to to roll something around. Right, right, right. I imagine you know it's the same's true when when you master a new a new technique, or even you know playing trumpet, going back and being you know hitting a lick, practicing it, practicing it, and practicing it, and then putting it down, and then coming back and just being like, Fah! oh yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah. And you, f I mean, you feel it too, like. I mean, like I, I've I've given a few guitar lessons, and uh, I, I mean, it's it's fun and it's really it's really like a beautiful thing when you see somebody's mind like click mm -hmm. and they're working on it, and then you know they'll get into it, and then I've I've worked with some people for like three months, and then they're just like, man, this is a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. I was like, well, yeah, because it's no longer like, uh, my man, I was my stepdad said it to me one day, and he explained it so well. And people out there might have already known this, but he was like, man, you know, it's really easy to, and it always looks as if you're making giant leaps, you know, when you're, when you, let's say in the six months or let's, hell, let's say two years of learning guitar, you know, they just, those doors open up and it's really quick, but if you're on top of it, but then you'll run into those, like you said, where you have to just hit a riff over and over. Those are the, that's the cracks, you know, mm -hmm. that's a little small jumps and those seem way, you know, way bigger and that's where I feel like, you know, I, I'm just, it sucks because, you know, you want to just, you want everybody to play, you know, and, and express themselves in that manner. But, I mean, the, the to focus and nitpick, you're like, yes, like, it's all that signal flow. Like, how well can I make this idea just mm -hmm. come right out, you know? Well, adding it to the lexicon, like, yeah. you know, like being able to say, okay, now that, that tool is in my tool belt and I can pull it out at any exactly. time. Exactly. Some of those tools take a long time oh, to yeah. sharpen, but they're totally. some of the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, it's just yeah, some of those techniques. But you know, like I, for me, I need to work on my um, country playing, man. You know, I'll, I'll have a couple licks down, but I mean, man, badass country licks. That shit never gets old, dude. You know, somebody <laughs> just ripping one, you're like, yeah, that motherfucker. And then that's a whole, that's a whole toolbox is right there. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Very cool. But you're right about that. Yeah, it's just an extra tool, man. Sure. Yeah, because that's when you see what a person really is. Like that's when someone has a full tool belt, then they get to be an artist. Oh yeah. You know, then then it's a matter of how do you put that language together. Like me in comedy right now, I'm learning to be funny. I'm learning yeah. how to write jokes. I've only been doing it for not even a year yet. So I'm I'm that I'm only that good. I've only had this much time to practice. And it takes Years and years and years, yeah. you know, some of the best have been doing it. Build for like up a motif, years. you know. It, right. But all of that is getting up, and doing the work, and doing the repetition so that you say these things so many times that when the time comes, they're all just right there for you to pull out, you know, and something that, that uh, I can't remember who said it, but it, it's really good advice is that uh, material is what you fall back on when you run out of things to talk about. And so, like, the best comics, like Doug Stanhope. Doug Stanhope's material, of course, I've never talked to him, so I don't know for sure. I just listened to some interviews and, and studied his work pretty thoroughly. But it's hard to tell, and I think this is true for a lot of good comedians, the best comedians, is it's really hard to tell what's not scripted mm -hmm. and what's their flow state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, to me, it looks like when Doug Stanhope goes into some of his material that it's a flow state like in and uh, Norm Macdonald is one that I've heard him specifically talk about this where he like he knows where the punchline is and he knows what it's going to be and he knows how it's going to time out but he has no idea how long it's going to take him to get there yeah and yeah. so he'll just tell this story and he'll wander through it and then boom it just creeps right yeah. up on it and that's all him in the flow state like that's the, one of the hardest things and how long has he been in the, in the game? Oh, know. God. His whole life. Yeah, like, okay. a fucking master of, of the craft. And But watching guys do that, and to see how many tools they have in the belt, so that you can't tell where the line is. Mm -hmm. That between, that's that's a stock, like, in, in the can line. Right. Or this is a train of thought and thing. Comedy's, yeah, and comedy, yeah. That's, that's it's a, cool. Comedy's fun to watch. I love, and, you know, and I gotta be honest, I don't, I don't think I've been to enough, like, I've been to some local comedy shows, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and there was a while for a couple of years. It seemed like I was going to one every other weekend. But 
Very cool. You know, you talking about it, that's... It, I would imagine it's got to be the same. You know what I mean? Like, you talk about flow state, you're talking about delivery, running up on material, sometimes, you know, stepping back, you're like, well, you, whether it's a zone thing or you're just like, like you said, could be a crown. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I know, and, it, and it's so vibe-based, too, huh? It's got to be. Yeah. Like, while you're up there. Like, it, that's, <laughs> and, it's, yeah, and you're trying it's to shit your so pants. It's so much fun. To be funny to say it's so much fun, and it's so terrifying. I, and I, I'm very fortunate in, in that... I am not so much afraid of, of bombing. Like, I was talking to, to one of my mentors over in Mobile that I, I've surrounded myself by with really good comics mm -hmm. so I can learn how to do this quickly. And I was discussing with, with one of them uh, about a friend of ours, and we were, we were talking about, you know, we were talking him up. We were like, God, oh, man, he's doing fucking great. Like, he's fucking up there killing it. Look at him go. And we were discussing his style and how he does that and, and how, how, how I could learn from that one particular thing, and I totally forgot where I was going with this, but being able to, to find people to help break it down and help you understand, and I really can't worry to remember where I was going with that, but because uh, I got distracted thinking about how good my buddy did last night because yeah, you crushed yeah, it, it was good. fucking awesome. <laughs> it good. was so yeah. good. It was so good. And so to, to be around Shout other people, yeah, yeah, and so to be around people that are crushing it and that, that can help me learn to get yeah. over some of those things. I mean, because you're not only awesome. you're not only taking notes off how they do it, but it's also you know on that emotional level, you know, like emotional and out. I guess maybe outward character, and I guess what I mean by that is you know like even the way they walk up on the steps and you know they do a thing, they like they're posted up, they like how they have their hands and 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 then into the emotional digest of it, you know, like players that mm -hmm. you're, just, you're just like man. I'm, it looks like that dude's never had a guitar wrong in his life. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. He's just there, he, you know. And I definitely have mentors like that as well. So, you know, I would imagine that. I mean, dude, I, I oh my gosh, I've, I've, I, now can I rip off names of comedians that I love? Eh, maybe a handful, but I've always just loved comedy. That's yeah. always been really cool. That's cool that, you know. You've been doing that because you're kind of getting fucking. I mean, you're pretty much getting a taste. Oh yeah, man. You this know is, what I mean? This like, is ground you, up, man. Like, like I, I just said, dude, if you yeah. if you pull out an instrument with this comedy, I'm gonna laugh my ass off. I no, I can't. I'm not. I, first off, I don't play music that well because uh, I think that's one of those things. Like, you have to master playing music before you can become a musical comedian. Because mm. one, because you one of two things is gonna happen. You're either going to be a master musician who becomes a master comic, or you are going to be a master musician who's just trying to be funny. Because to be a comedian uh, and not have something to hide behind, be a musician who has a retreat from a bomb. Like, right. so if I've got a guitar on and I toss out a bomb and just crickets, I can play a song. Yeah. But if it's just me and I toss out a bomb, I then have to say something that overcomes that. And, yeah, and that's a much harder task. Well, for me, it's a harder task. I've never been a musical comedian, so I don't know for sure. But I, um, yeah, the guys like Reggie, I can see the difference. Yeah, like Reggie Watts and what's they're that two thing? skill sets. It's not just one. That's that's what I'm getting at. Like yeah. that's a really complicated thing. Right, you're juggling. Right? Yeah, you, you know, you're trying to make two egos in a way. Not even egos. I guess it's just characters. Yeah, you know, merge together. Well, it's like two different languages, and you got to figure out how those two languages way, talk to each other and, and communicate along the same lines. But we mentioned Reggie Watts; uh, he's a good example. I'm a big Reggie Watts fan. Yeah, yeah, I love Reggie. Um, okay, there's like Reggie Watts and what's that? Uh, Demetrius. Um, oh yeah, what's his name? He had a show, guitar. but yeah, I know. Who but, he's I mean, about. yeah. yeah. Bo Burnham is another one. Yeah, Bo Burnham. Uh, Flight of the Concords. You know, yeah, their their shit's really. I, really I apologize if I fucked up Bo's name. I don't want to hear about it. I, he's awesome. I may fuck up his name. <laughs> For whoever out there thinks they need to send me right. that email. I appreciate it, but... Yeah, so I mean, at least in that in that area. And I mean, hell, that, I can't remember the dude's last name. Like I said, Demetrius. I just remember watching his... Demetrius Martin. Martin. Demetrius Martin. Demetrius Martin. Okay. So, you know, even in his stand-up skits, you know, he's playing, he's... he's I mean, I've seen that piano. He's got the whiteboard, and you know, it's very. I would like. I would imagine you're. I mean, not even imagine. You're. I believe you're 100 percent right. In the fact that you having something to do with your hands. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if 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 
Yeah, hell, if somebody wanted to talk shit to me while I'm on stage, like, I guarantee I'm be louder than you. So, you talk, <laughs> you talk, and I'm going to be louder. You right. know? So, it's, you're right, it's that shroud uh, to hide behind. And, uh, and that, and, and, you know, like, I've, I've always wondered from the perspective, like, with being a musician, you know, you, you're in a scene, and this, I mean, depending on whatever you're doing, but if you're involved in a scene, you see players get better, or they go through shit, mm-hmm. or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I, I think that would be really interesting to see, you know, like, a, a, a comedy scene like that. Because, you know, the joke, the jokes that, and I've heard it a million times, you know, like, comedians are some of the some of the most depressed people. I, myself, oh, yeah. devour certain things with jokes, just because I'm like, if I don't, I'm just going to lose my mind in this case, you know? Um, you have to. Yeah. and But that, I don't know, that's, that's the beauty of it. Comic relief is great. It, it's awesome. It's awesome. Uh, Louis C.K. That I, I heard him talk about it one time, and he said it's it's an impossibly difficult thing to for your job to be to walk into a, a room in front of a whole bunch of people you've never met before and say laugh, like yeah. making then make those people laugh. Like, oh, and if if even for somebody like Louis to to, to like have said that it it's good perspective but having a scene it's it's funny because or there are things that are funny about it because comedy is as similar as it is to other performing arts it's very it has its uniquenesses as well and one of the uniquenesses of comedy is that there is no cover yeah. uh, you get I am a firm believer that every joke gets one original laugh and that's yeah. it yeah. And then after that, it doesn't matter like how big a fan somebody is, how many times they want to hear that joke. Sooner or later, that joke has a shelf life, and it, yeah. it will expire. Mm-hmm. Some of the best songs, and more and more songs, as more and more songs become available, get covered and repeated because that's kind of what music does. Is it's an encapsulated, yeah. repeatable thing. Whereas comedy, nobody's doing. Nobody is doing the Dark Star Orchestra of comedy. Like nobody goes out right. and performs Carlin's routine, and uh, and and says this was Carlin's show from this yeah, theater. Totally. That never happens, which is interesting. I've never really thought about it that way, but but it's but it's still very cool because you think about it. In that's the same as as a musician saying this is my version of a cover. Mm-hmm. Like this is because some of the best covers I've ever heard are are done by a specific group for a specific reason. It's right, like, no, right. fucking Yonder Mountain String Band covered that Grateful Dead song, and it's, ah, yeah, you know. Exactly, because, I, I mean, hell, I, I'd i say that they, I mean, have I listened to them that much? Scarlet no, Begonias is one I was thinking of, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, I mean, take whatever band covering, like, all right, I'll, here's a bit of fun fact. Uh, first album I ever listened to, uh, front to back, was Rage Against the Machines' Renegades album. yeah. And I loved that album because I thought, you know, even as a kid, I was like, man, this is cool. Like, they covered songs that got them here, and it's yeah. their last record. And, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've always been a huge Rage fan, you know. So, and me having an older brother, that kind of helped with it. But that whole album always put that in my mind. Like, you know, you, that's, I mean, that's a huge part. Community mm-hmm. of property, like, sharing your, your, like, the joy that it brings me for example if I showed you a song that I've been listening to for the past week yeah it's just undeniable like yeah. love and just like dude I can't I you know I do that to Quinn all the time I'm like dude listen to this I'm like, okay, like <laughs> cramming my phone in his face he's like dude yeah alright cool you know but I'm like dude check it out but anything like a cover I mean it's you know and done well yeah and done yeah. well man is like fucking kudos like I saw hell I even saw I was at uh, Purple Hats um last year in Swanee mm-hmm. and I'm you know uh, amphitheater dumpster funk comes on where I'm hanging with the homies having a great time in the pit and then he decides to start playing time after time and I'm like <laughs> holy shit you know it's just like that's a great I mean, for a, you know that's a great song and it's just like I don't know to me it always adds up like yes perfect song they're killing it I feel so good and and you're right I don't actually think that could be done in comedy unless Unless it's more of like, you know, when you, because I think, I think part of, you know, being comical and being in the moment, just like having a funny friend, like that friend that could quote 
movie quotes and it sounds mm-hmm. just like you know like voices and shit like that uh, I think it would be more of like a character you know like Eddie Murphy's character back in this period yeah. or, or Chappelle's early mm-hmm. stuff you mm-hmm. know where it's like am I That's wanting to be loud am I, am, I, am, am I trying to be a loud like in your face type guy am I just trying to be you know kind of myself or mm-hmm. you know what I mean like yeah. I think it's more of like an outfit does that make sense yeah yeah that's that is that is interesting I, I, I while you were saying that I thought uh, also trying to cover a solo note for note like how hard it is to replicate somebody's tone oh, maybe yeah. that's what we're talking about here is the the je ne sais quoi that somebody brings to it the seasoning that somebody yeah. brings to to a topic because there are only so many topics there are only so many jokes you can tell so eventually it comes down to how that particular formula of a joke plays through my filters and everything which so so yeah like if I were gonna try and be a Prince cover like am I ever gonna have Prince's tone am I ever gonna play every one of his solos note for note right and it, what, what part of that's art you know there's there's a lot of art that goes into it but is it the yeah. kind of art that you go out and say, I don't know man that's that, an well, interesting comparison would, that may be a fruit well actually no because if you did if you did note for note you're a tribute man you're paying homage tribute yeah so true, I think true. I think with you know like I said I mean, all right I there's just no tribute comics <laughs> right right exactly yeah, yeah, I'm gonna dress, yeah I'm gonna dress up just like Dave Spell and I'm just gonna bounce out of stuff no I mean that's uh, why I fell in love with Chappelle for example because it was like sketch comedy so like, that's great like yeah. you just put on different man like character like how the Chappelle I, show is what you're talking about yeah, yeah. And, and you know the beauty of that like that maybe that's and that's my humor I love, I love, look, I love satire. I'm not against the laughing to somebody. That dude juggled his keys. I was, I could, I <laughs> choked up. I thought it was funny. You know, it's like somebody like dressing up like that person or laughing like that person or mimicking. It's just like, it's cool. And maybe it's easier for uh, somebody to understand. You know, it's like, oh, you, you put something together. I like that. It's funny, you know. But I've also heard that when you laugh now please correct if I'm wrong and the internet might be just des- might destroy me for this I could be totally wrong but if when you laugh it's just your brain not knowing what to do so you're like oh fuck that's funny ha ah. like somebody I've heard that from a fuck. when you hear a joke your brain just doesn't know what to do it's just like uh, it just gets overloaded it's like that's funny and I'm just gonna make noise mm, it's more nuanced than that so I think where that comes from well, I'm gonna play Snopes for a second uh, I think where that comes from is people say when when people cry, it's because of this emotional overwhelming. Yeah. In that, whatever's going on is so far removed from what we expected, and this is what it has to do with it's expectation. And so when our expectations are so far misaligned with reality, it throws us for for a loop. And so to resolve that, we kind of reset, and that's this highly emotional state that. That you could that could right. be, be no, being I, referenced. I love here. the way that that. So laughter becomes the defense mechanism to, uh, for some people, instead of crying because something is scary or unresolvable or it seems uh, not easy to resolve, laughter can be a defense mechanism. So, you, so yeah, those two things right. are, are are rather synonymous. I think the laughter part is a secondary to the the expectations right. well, because that, people can you can still laugh at certain things it, it, oftentimes what's most funny to me is things that are relevant to me yeah. so like if I'm going to get caught off guard and get a hard chuckle it's because somebody manages to hit something it's like oh that happened to me right, Tuesday right yeah. that's fresh yeah. it's fresh and so if it's fresh you get that you get that good chuckle, but I don't think that's always necessarily an expectation thing. Sometimes it is an expectation thing in that the turn is the funny part. Uh, like sometimes I think about well, if if there are only two answers, then I'm gonna go with the funny one because the, yeah. the one you want is not the funny one. The, you know, the other one is the I funny like that. one. I like that. Yeah. And. Um, not a, not my original thought. I got that from somebody else. Like there, I think it might have been Lewis Black that was like, "They're only." God, Lewis Black yeah. is so funny. <laughs> He's fucking but see, great. It's the yell. Uh, it's the yell. Like <laughs> that's what gets me. That shit makes me laugh. He's dude. so like, good. Ah man, it's it, in humor. 
is equal with music in the terms of like it's like I can ask you who you're into mm -hmm. you know, comedy wise mm -hmm. and I might get a good feel for what you know what might make you laugh or mm -hmm. whatever same thing with music like that that's that's good that's good you're, yeah that, that merges well it's fun. It's a learning experience for me. I get to go back and... and well, now I need to come out to a damn show. I need to do oh, yeah, dude. Uh, well, we could call this the plug segment. Uh, back Porch Comedy in Pensacola. Uh, comedy whatever. Mobile Comedy over in Mobile. Uh, Comptonsmith.com for anybody that hasn't already seen it. Um, all, the, all the stuff that I'm doing and, uh, and comedy-wise, that's that's pretty much the breakdown Yeah. to get to all of that. Um, and I'm, I'm what sorry. do you need to plug? Oh, what do I need to plug? Um, well, what do I need to plug? Oh, well, I guess the this is fresh in my brain. Um, so also, I don't know if you know this about me, I also produce an engineer and um, work with, like I just met a, a new producer out in uh, Mobile, his name's Hub, uh, Hub Stacy, sorry. And uh, a lot of a lot of cool talent, you know, more, when I say EDM, I mean, you know, everything from... Um, Neo soul, modern type stuff, R and B, hip hop, blah blah blah. Anyways, we just put an in promo video uh, for, a, yeah. for a single that's about to come out. Um, Very so, cool. Yeah, man, it's it's really cool. So you can uh, check that out on my Instagram, J O Z E V P H O Z. One more time. So it's Joseph Oz. So J O Z E V P H O Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that uh, yeah, you know, and, and it's it's just kind of a little a trailer. Uh, Right now, but hopefully it'll be out. In, I'm I'm hoping for a month, for a month and a half. Very cool. Um, what else do you guys do production-wise? Just uh, um, well, just music videos. Well, so um, so actually no. So he he's a producer that was uh, I met him through Quentin. Um, he just came down from North Carolina. Uh, you know, just wanted to kind of come back home for a little bit, and uh, he does more actually more kind of. Well, I'm trying to, I guess it'd be like chill chill hop type you know it's just really good sample really pretty samples and vocal melodies and stuff like that cool celestial kind yeah, of yeah exactly um and i've you know i have a, a kind of a duos um production company with myself and a dj uh, dj ice um, and that's called invisible soul so we just you know between all that we just got connected and started working and he had a, he's working on an ep and i he's like you on it. I was like, there's a bear Fuck shit you. in the woods. You know? so, <laughs> and he had this great singer named Taylor. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of, it just was really quick, you know. So I, I'm, that was definitely, the, the, like I said, the freshest thing to plug um, for me. And then, you know, really excited about the writing that's going on with, uh, yeah, probably. So hopefully I will have a plug next episode if we do another one. <laughs> yeah, we you will. A plug. <laughs> we will. We will. Um, but yeah, probably is on Facebook. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, and and uh, their schedules up there. Your schedules up mm -hmm. there. And the website, and also um, Instagram. Well, we are. Yeah, probably. That's you'll get a lot of the updates via that. Quicker. Fuck yeah! Because hey, man, I, I've moved to Instagram. I'm I don't know about way. you. I, I'm headed that <laughs> way. <laughs> All even... my stuff is at Kilt Chamberlain. If anybody's looking for it. My God, uh, right I'm everything at Kilt Chamberlain. If it's good, do me a favor, Google. At Kilt Chamberlain and see what all comes up. Oh, we'll do it right now. We'll do a little little experiment. At what is it? Kilt Chamberlain. Kilt. For those of you following us in in the Twitterverse, uh, I am am trying to learn more about Twitter. I've got some friends that that do a podcast called Twitter yeah. Sitters. It's it's definitely on Twitter. Uh, Compton Smith, Compton Smith, on Instagram. Boom. Look at that, bro. So the story I got to tell this story because because I love my boy. Uh, I was Carson Taylor is uh, is one of my comedy mentors. He's been doing comedy movie a long time, uh -huh. and uh, he is the bartender at the Blind Mule now. Uh, and he, uh, I get to host the open mic at the Blind Mule every Wednesday in Mobile, oh, which is that. a pleasure and a privilege. I love that place. And it's friggin' awesome. I'm honored. And uh, so Carson is uh, the bartender over there. And ever since the first time I started hanging out over there, we were just shooting the shit. And he asked me about the kilt one night, and he came up with that nickname. So kilt Chamberlain. Kilt Chamberlain. <laughs> uh, 
I like how you stick true to backstories, and you're just like, I'm gonna stick with that. Yeah, like dude. It. Well, it's better. If everything's better if it's got a story. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, there's a story behind everything. Like, I, I figured that out a long time ago because I worked in the casino business. I had to wear a suit and tie every day, mm. and so I'm walking around with a leash on that does fucking mean suit, shit. If I saw you in a suit and tie, I think I'd, that'd blow my mind. Good. Yeah. Blow my mind too. <laughs> my mind will have already been blown. It's yeah, funny. It's weird. It's weird. I don't do monkey suits very well. Yeah, I did. I did a little nine to five, and that was. I told myself I, was like, I can't do this. Man. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, it's not. I don't think that's what human beings are supposed to do, man. Yeah, and hell, I definitely not me. I just I'll, I get impatient. Somebody's telling me what to do. I don't mind somebody telling me what to do, but when it's for a little amount of pay, it's like no, dude. Yeah. Nice. What do you think of this universal basic income shit coming down the pike? Did you see that? Presidential candidate. Hang on, I'm going to press this button. Presidential candidate, 2020, running on the platform of universal basic income. $1,000 stipend every month to nearly every American. Wait, wait, what? I know, right? All that's real. But uh, all I can do is ask why. Um, like what? A couple of reasons. Primary reason is it affords uh, upward mobility to okay. people who make fucking nothing and don't survive. The vast majority of Americans live below the, the, the poverty line, which the technical poverty line is like $25,000 a year. Yeah. And there are a ton of people that live under that. Nobody can live for $25,000 a year and be comfortable and successful and happy. There's no way you become Maslow's self-actualized human being living $25,000 a year. Right, right. So $1,000 a month gets everybody that's in legit poverty. And technically, if you make less than like $55,000 a year, you're not supporting a family. You're not supporting a wife and kids. You're not sending kids to college. Like you are well below the, the, the median. Yeah, so yeah. the way that that's framed nowadays is inaccurate to begin with. So one of the things that universal basic income seeks to do is to remedy that gap. So this thousand dollars, it would, would be, uh, basically to cover shelter, food, and, and give some security to everybody. Okay. So that means whatever you're doing now, you have enough breathing room to not live paycheck to paycheck and yeah. be able to do a little better for yourself. Or, depending on what level you're at, help you move to the next level. So it allows, it makes upward mobility easier by greasing some wheels. So not necessarily handing every, it's gotta be like and the way- 2020, you said. Yeah, and the way that this guy's build it, uh, he's done all the research, is that this is the solution to the problem that we will be facing in 15 years, and there is no other solution. And his reasoning for that is the, the inequity that will come about due to automation just in the trucker section mm -hmm. of the working class will be cataclysmic to the economy. Well, something like 1.5 million jobs, conservatively, white men, uh, middle-aged white men that are truck drivers will be out of a job in not a 15, 20 year time frame, but in like a five year time frame once this whole thing starts coming right, down the pike. Right. So how do you solve for 1.5 million displaced jobs? And he's thought this through and in his opinion, uh, the, it arcs out to uh, we have to find a way to, to, to be this next level society. And that gets us to Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek egalitarian some <laughs> form of we don't have homeless people. Like, yeah. we don't have homeless vets to I mean, solve some simple problems. Right. And it's, and it's just like with any big problem, I mean, like we're talking about with whether it's farming or or uh, or even, you know, global warming. Yeah. I mean, it's got it's to gotta be something that, you know, like it, that's what... Like I told you, you know, going back when it's kind of looking at the bigger picture is kind of blowing my mind. But it took me to understand, like, wow, my part really does matter because of on the grand scheme of things. And that's the being said with if we do perpetuate in the same way that we're going, obviously these gaps that we do have between, let's say, market crashes, they just get smaller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, you know, and, and do I keep up on a lot of the political stuff? I, not too much. So when you told me that, I, that's. 
I that's it's curious and I and I and I like the way that you explain it because I think if I were to just read into it, you know, having somebody just be like, boom, here it is, you know. Um, so what do you what do you think? I mean, I mean that's that's really like I said, the gap's getting smaller, and so just truckers alone, like 1.5. So what would that do? I'm just trying to I'm trying to comprehend like. Name some other scales as far as I say scales, like environments where it would just destroy. Uh, like, well, think about anything that could be automated. It's okay, so here's another example. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. Uh, another example is, and this is happening right now, real world, as we speak. There are companies that, uh, we all saw the, the movie Office, yeah. right? Where they hire Bob and Bob to come in and streamline everything, which is fire the extraneous people, basically. Headhunters. Right. This happens. The new version of that is you hire a business, and that business's job is to make you more efficient. Okay. So they come in, and they fire half of everybody, and they grow your profits by automating as much as possible. But not only do they, they get rid of all your employees, they start outsourcing the stuff that they can outsource and don't need in-house people for. So they pay you pay even less there. But right. in this outsourcing process, through this secondary company, their goal is to automate as much as possible. So what they do is, while they're outsourcing, is they find ways over time to automate the outsource stuff. So these companies in, that are happening right now, they, they guarantee a 50% uh, profit increase the first year, an efficiency increase the first year, and a 25% increase the second year. In, in some instances. And I'm pulling this straight from In A Nutshell uh, YouTube channel. If anybody wants to go reference it, you can, they've done, all, and they link all the research and all that good stuff. But this is their example. And so, uh, so you immediately, it's immediately, you're, it's immediately fucked. Like, uh, having, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm not missing anything from, no, good. from their example. That's just, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. You know? Like, so, is that that's guaranteed 2020, or that's just like something that's like? Oh no, he's a candidate for president. Okay. He's from Hawaii, oh. and uh, that's that's part of his platform is the universal basic income. And um, yeah, so I mean, yeah. so I think we can all automation. It, well, and here's the other side of the universal basic income and the automation thing. People want to demonize it and and say, oh, well, you know, they, they took our jobs. <laughs> to go back to that but why in the world do we not have as the leading or as as a wannabe first world leading nation why isn't the question how do we get to that point for everybody why isn't that the question why isn't it how do we how do we make it possible for everybody to to rise to that level and then how do we take this automation and make it work for everybody else Right. Instead of displacing all these people, how do we enable automation to make the income for individuals? Yeah. So, and those are the questions that we're going to have to face sooner or later because artificial intelligence is coming down the pike too. Like, the dam is honestly, broke. honestly That's coming. faster than we, we kind of realize at certain points. Oh yeah, you know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I know Volvo just put out like it's official. You can just take your hands off the wheel and don't drive the car. Ah. <laughs> Do tell. And I haven't sell, seen this they yet. They sell that shit. Oh yeah, dude. You just, yeah, cruising, man. Just so, a great well, yeah. Time. I know Tesla made self-drive. Like Tesla's mm -hmm. known for that. But Volvo's got a self-driving oh, yeah. car oh, out. Yeah, Volvo was like kind of already doing research. And I mean, I've always been a Volvo head. I've always loved mm -hmm. Volvo. So, um, I read about it a while back, and I know Tesla was doing it too. But uh, yeah, their new like XC90s or whatever, man. They just how do they do it? I would. I mean, I know it's got to be some relative thing with, you know, radar detection and shit like that. You know, because I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. bins they have it where you know you can like, oh, it presses button and it's kind of cruise control and all those. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Now, if there's no car there, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the reason I ask That's is because shit. yeah. So Volvo, it sounds like they're going the route of DARPA, which is sensory apparatus processing information and uh, and then feeding that back into some kind of drive the car system. Right. 
Whereas one of the things that Tesla's done, and I've listened to Elon Musk talk about this a couple of times, is the granddaddy of self-driving would be not all these independent systems relaying information, but just a visual system. Like the way that we process information is we take all of the cues visually with a few auditory cues. But if we can take teach a car to drive purely on visual input, like that's next level shit. Yeah, because so, the processing power is right, way higher. Than right. You could do it in milliseconds and below. It's cool. It's cool shit. Yeah, man. I, I love stuff. The radar track, like they're doing they're doing the sensory thing. That's cool. You familiar with DARPA? Like you remember all the DARPA challenges, the self-driving cars and shit? Yeah, yeah. It's been a while since so I've actually talked about it, but I do remember DARPA. Um, yeah, they're still around. God knows what they're making now. We haven't heard from them in a long time. So I'm just wondering where, you know, DMC, DeLorean's going to just come back out, you know, in 2018. <laughs> I thought they made a comeback a couple years ago. Did they? I thought, I, well. DMC. What does that what? stand for again? Uh, uh, the Daimler Chrysler. Okay, that's it, that's it. It's got to be, right? Yeah, it's got to be. Um, I totally pulled shit. that out of my ass. No, I believe it. I'm with you on it. Daimler. It's got to be Daimler Chrysler. Um, yeah, man. I, yeah, have you have you always been a car guy? I love cars, man. Uh, here's, here's the epitome of my car guy. Uh, as a child... My grandfather, excuse me, my father, allowed me to drive as my first car his 1968 Mustang. Mm. That was the epitome of my carness. That was it. And then it fell off. Damn. Because how do you do better than that? You like after that, it was like I'm moment. over it. <laughs> you, you're, you're, Done. Your fortune was coming in. You didn't even know. It was like here he is, come the race car driver. Fuck yeah, right oh, there. Yeah. Damn man, I'm just kidding. No. I've I've always had that. I've always loved cars. That was like, I I wanted to do wanted the first dream. I had two dreams as a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut and then just come home and race Formula One cars. Oh, God, dude. And then I told my mom. I was like, Mom, can I like you know? Because I mean, with anything, any sport, and there's kind of like that degree of it. And for me, like racing and Formula One, it's like go karts. Mm -hmm. Can I get in a go kart? Mm -hmm. I was like, right, can I get into this? And she was like, Son, I love you. But if you went into that field, your mother would take a lot of pills. And I was like, damn it. Ah. Oh, I was like, great. all right, mom, fine. You know, and I just, for the age, you know, I've had my cool cars, fun cars, but cars are something, you know. It's like, it's really, it's really cool, man. And I think that a lot of people um, misunderstand that. Like, you know, if we're talking about connection, like we are talking about earlier, like, I feel a deep connection with my car, mm -hmm. you know, like it's got me to where I need to be. It's helped me. It's saved my life. It's, you know, it, like a horse. If you're in the yeah, wild west. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, and it's in, you know, and there's poetic thing, way to look at anything. Sure. You know, at least most. I am a hopeless romantic, so I will right. constantly come up with beautiful ways to yeah, look at shitty to situations. Totally. Totally. So, you know, it's like the day the car rolls out, man, or you take a picture of that car. You know, just as if you take a picture of a human from that day on, it's just getting older. Well, they're like our exoskeletons. Yeah, man. Like, we've created these these things that are, uh, they're, they become a, a big part of us. Yeah, dude, they're like, fun. if you're driving down the road, it's not like, oh, man, I'm just driving. It's like, whoa, there's millions of tiny explosions happening in front of me. I'm sitting in a seat. It's like if I'm sitting in a plane. I'm sitting in a seat going, like... I'm fifty th or thirty thousand feet up, going five hundred miles an hour. This is some crazy shit right now. Right, you you're know? hurtling through space yeah, dude. That, while you are like, hurtling through space while you are hurtling through space. Oh, it's incomprehensible man. on some level. That shit is fun, fun. man. You know, like just you, you, you hear the motor and you're just like, dude, this is cool, man. And then the first time you ever get thrown back in a seat, oh, and you're not on a fucking roller coaster. <laughs> torque, dude. Just never the torque. So good. That's why I, I did. Now that nine to five I talked about earlier, I, that was I worked at O'Reilly's, O'Reilly Auto Parts, mm -hmm. and there would be guys that would come in there, and they'd have these ninety, like ninety eight trucks or not like well, this one. No, this dude came in with a ninety one Chevy pickup, had nine hundred thirty horsepower. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. And guys come like. Wait, like, how do you not twist the whole frame with that much oh, torque? Oh, I mean, that, that... Like, holy shit. At that point, their drive shafts are huge as hell. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a truck. Yeah, man. Well, and it had a whole <laughs> NOS set up and everything. You know, you just did ah! a lot of cool shit. Like, a buddy of mine working there was working on a 72 Datsun. And, 
and then I, you know, I'd go into, I went into, and it sound, some people might be like, well, that's not that cool, but I went into a shop, huge tuner head, and I go in there, and I'm delivering a part, and they had a nine, 1986 Toyota Corolla right-hand drive, like, pristine condition, mm. and I was like, that's cool, <laughs> man, like, that's only made in Japan, dude, and it's here, like, in full, there's some rare cars around here, man. Yeah. And you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it, man. Like, it's it's really cool. Car because, culture here is pretty thick. Because toys are awesome. Toys are awesome, dude. Toys and then, you know, awesome. then I have to kind of disassociate myself because I'm like, look, music is more important. Don't spend money on your car. Like, don't be an <laughs> idiot. Like, pay attention to what you need to pay attention to, you know? Like, if I were that, you know, musician who has tons of money, I will definitely have a, uh, that money will go into a garage, a car lift, and just really nice tools. There you go. And then I'll just get... See, the car that I'm thinking about getting is uh, a minivan. Oh, dude. You know who convinced me? And I was, like, looking after we talked. Adam Cooper. Yeah. We were outside the... We were playing Vinyl Music Hall. Never thought you'd say Adam Cooper, but not surprised at all that you said Adam (laughs) Cooper. It was the weirdest reaction ever. It was so funny, man. He was like... I was walking, and we walked his car. I was like, wait, did you have another car? He's like, yeah, it was a a Toyota or Honda or something. Yeah, but it was a beautiful, pristine, like, Honda Odyssey van. Yeah. And I was just like, man, this thing's nice. And he's like, dude, it's great condition. And it was like, I had 200,000 miles. I was like, oh, you're gravy. And he's like, two grand, dude. Look at this. And I was like, and I immediately, like, a couple yeah. days later, I was like, damn, that's a really good idea. And I was like, <laughs> looking on Facebook Marketplace. But minivans are, are I respect, man. I did I would love six that. months. Uh, when I when I got done at the University of Alabama, I uh, I needed some time off, and so I took six months, did some couch surfing, went to see some friends of mine, but I outfitted the back, took the seats out, had my camping gear, and uh, cruised yeah, like dude. fucking gone. It was a beautiful thing, and um, I love all these big conversion vans, and you see these campers and all that good stuff. But having lived in a camper for so long now. If I were gonna go out and go on a road trip, if I can't get it done in a minivan, what do I need the rest of that shit for? Like, I got yeah. my tent, I got my hammock, and I got a minivan for emergencies. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, that's true. So that's kind of that's yeah. where my headspace is no, at. That's... But then again, I'm a single dude looking to do it by myself. So, camping and traveling options are, are a different thing. And tuner cars and muscle cars are not touring vehicles. Those are oh, yeah. weekend toys versus oh, yeah. the kind of now, I've definitely learned Long my lesson, toy, you know, yeah. paying for expensive shit, and it's like, man, why did I, why did I buy this car? But you know, it's just that I've become more mature about it, and that was, and you know, and it's like it goes to show, like you're fueled by your environment, mm-hmm. you know, because in that environment, I, you know, I worked there for two and a half years, mm-hmm. and like the discount on parts was ridiculous. <laughs> so I'm just like. I'll take, take one of those. those. I'll and take I, one of those. I had a charge account, but they took that away from me because they were just like, <laughs> dude, you're not paying it back. I, was like, I had $74 left one time, and I just let them take it out of my check. They are like, oh, we took it away from me. I was like, what? I was like, I thought we'd just take it away. He's like, no, we just got tired of you doing that. I was like, damn it, man. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and uh, I definitely learned my lesson, you know, on, on spending spending money like that. And like I said, that's to finish up what I was saying, you know, product of your environment, like, I was only doing it when I was there, and you know my friends. That you know we go on cruises or whatever. But you know that's 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 the kind of go. And one thing we were talking about before we started, you know, the whole entrepreneurial spirit and things, and you know your mm-hmm. opportunity and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it's a huge thing to you know uh, you know you are the company you keep. So I was just like, man, I'm just hanging around with people that get drunk and just really want to work on their cars. Like, that's cool, but I'm not. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, this is fun. It's a hobby. Sure, taking it too serious, I need to get out of here. Rescue me. Yeah. Jesus, take the wheel. I uh, still like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, that's one of the reasons I think it's fun to to. Ever since high school, I've been one of those people that's a go between between the clicks. Yeah. Like, uh, I gotta go, these people shoot better pool, man. I gotta go hang out with them to learn better. how to play pool. Absolutely. I gotta go hang out with these people to learn how to do this shit. Like, sorry, y'all don't know how to play StarCraft. Gotta go do this. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> dude. That's real shit. Yeah, that's, and, and, and you, and that's, that, I think at early ages, you know, that I was that, I was that dude in high school, you know, I didn't have, a, I, shit, I had like, maybe like five friends. I was a real, like, isolated type dude, but, I was cool with all the different groups. 
my mind, it makes sense to where, even in your case, even if you're a comedian, you know, like your ability to associate and disassociate and apply and like you said tools like it's kind of like the early workings of mm -hmm. musician, comedian or, or whatever, something that takes information and a perception and then just puts it right back. Because mm -hmm. that, you know, that's one thing. Somebody's stressed or whatever, I'm like, dude, it's, it's perception, bro. Like your perspective is you just look, you're just looking at it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, hell, that's why I, I want to go to a comedy show. It's like, show me a perspective that I'm just not. Oh, it's so much fun. You, know? and you find a good, I, what amazes me the most about it is, it's a voluntary thing. You have, uh, Steve Hofstetter, I got to see him in Mobile and he got on stage and he's like, you guys get to decide how good a show this is gonna be. And he did his little, little thing. But that point is very, is very astute because in comedy, much like in music, you either give yourself over to it entirely or you're just sitting there going judgy, judge, judge bullshit, yeah. not enjoying it. And so when you let a comedian just take hold of your brain and be like, we're going to go over here and this is funny, yeah. we're going to go over here and this is it's funny. experience, man. Right, exactly. And that gets back to, to what you mentioned, you know, the, the things that you experienced growing up. That's straight out of Kantian philosophy, you know, the critique of pure reason. The experience is true knowledge. And then, that's real. That's real shit, man. You can't. You cannot. I just don't think you can teach wisdom. It's only learned through experience. And you know, you see a friend struggling or whatever. Or like, you know, so I've been some in a situation where somebody's hurt. And I'm just like patting your back or patting their back. Like you just got. It's, it's gonna hurt, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it, it's just that. Well, and that's how the truth thing came yeah. about. When I was developing the truth, love, and peace philosophy, you know, it started out as fear, power, and novelty, which is the other side of the coin. But the 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 reason that I landed on truth is because that's the inevitability. You know, what is, where is the power in in the long run? And it's, it's always going to be in the truth because the truth is inevitable. And the reason yeah. the truth is inevitable is because you can't. It is the formula. It is not the variables. But the reason that it is the formula is because it is the sum of all perspective. It's the reason no one person can have it. You know, no one person can know all of the truth. You just fucking can't. Sorry, you're yeah. you're bound by your context. You're bound by this. You can only see this. And so, to get outside of that and to think in a bigger picture and to think about somebody else's perspective and all the other perspectives, that's when you get into like real truth. Like when that's you get really beyond true. self. That's 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 a really you hit it right on the head, man. Like you know the way you said it made me think metaphorically speaking, like. You scrape, you drug your hand across all the back parts of your mind, you know, to know where your limit is. Mm -hmm. And it's not even to put that in. It's like the whole thing when somebody's like mind and body, you know. It's like no, it's one thing, and that's understanding the limit, like you said, this this flesh. What would you call it? Are they two legged? The two legged meat suit. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So it's you know knowing where. I mean, maybe that's. I, maybe that's what it comes down to like why you want and need and deserve and have to find something to put your heartfelt time into heartfelt being love appreciation respect overall bliss like because honestly if you're if, if you're self aware you will reach limits mm -hmm. you know? and you know that's why I love talking to you you're very in tune and talking to other people that are in tune like you know that they like it's like like you said like I'm here I know I'm in the skeleton but man it passed this you know it, it understanding the truth is like I'm in an environment I'm you know there is control there is this there's a lot of different variables that come into play that distort my my image or my viewpoint mm -hmm. but that truth I mean just like I said as a, you know, I'll say it sometimes this is as true as the shoes are on my feet you know like it's finding that you know if I'm pissed, if I'm sad, if I'm confused, like, I need to play. Mm -hmm. And if I don't play, like, my truth is gone. You know what I mean? That's like, like a meditation. Yeah, man. Like, that's the truth that I know, you know? And, and, and I know a lot of different players like that. That That's why they do it, man. Like, I've seen them in really horrible situations, but they're just keep playing. And they've put on some of their best work, you know? And I think that's, and that's a huge, and that's just cool, like, talking to you about that and that imagery coming up, you know? Like... If you haven't 
taken your hand and, and scratched the back parts of your mind, like, you really don't know what, mm -hmm. not even at least, not what truth is, but at least the idea of it. Well, a famous philosopher once said, it is a far scarier thing to examine the dark recesses of our minds than it is to stand on the front lines of a battlefield. Yeah. And Unbelievable. there I know a lot of people that'll jump on both sides of that, but there is there is nothing and it's one of the things that I love about Buddhism. Not so much that it's a you know, religious faith, whatever, but that it's a psychological practice. Like there are steps that you can take. And one of those is sitting down and looking deeply into ourselves and saying, Oh, I caused a lot of these problems myself. <laughs> exactly, and once we get over yeah, that hurdle, yeah. then you're like, oh, okay, now we can look at how to solve these things. Like, what are these things? How do we deal with these things? What right. are all that stuff becomes a lot easier when you realize that, uh, that you're an active participant in all of this stuff and, and that you can choose to sit calmly and peacefully. Right. And learning how to do that is something that I was never taught, unfortunately, and made my life interesting. But, but it is kind of the point in that there is another perspective, like uh, Jeff Bridges. In uh, Tron 2, it's the only good part of Tron 2 was Jeff Bridges. <laughs> but he, you know, he does this whole Zen thing. He tells his, his character is very Zen. Yeah, yeah it's I great. Love like I it's love a cool it. representation yeah, character. He definitely right. makes that movie. Now, I, I do think, man, what what is it? You just said something that, that don't, I don't want to lose it because it was a good idea. But um, oh, that's it. So you were talking about. Um, you know, like with with Buddhism, is this fall into? I think this is, I don't know. You know, like I don't know if it's a certain form of monk, if you will. But um, the one thing I was taught that really helped me a lot was, right. you know, whenever you like, you know, my anger issues are kind of always in my family. You know, mm -hmm. and so as a kid, my mom always taught me how to meditate. You know, so I was more like my mom, and and in that I discovered, wait, when I'm really mad. And I just stop and I listen to it, and I just like, I like, you know, s try to sit there, and I feel, you know, you feel your blood boil, you're pissed, man, but you're just like, I'm not gonna react, mm -hmm. and it's like the total digestive. But you know, and I noticed that over the years as I got older, it became easier, and then obviously when I didn't do it, you know, mm -hmm. it slips up and you, you lose that kind of remedy. But that is part of the kind of thorough blood mm -hmm. teachings of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, which you know, if you're happy, sad, you digest it. You th you don't you think and then react type thing like not and I don't know if it's think but it's the process well, of like okay this is what I'm feeling so you know what I mean look at it from the other side in Buddhism it starts with the four noble truths like a real basic level mm -hmm. so the their terminology is uh, suffering and that to to be in the meat suit like suffering is is real we can't escape it we're all born we all get sick we all get old we all die. Like, those are the four basic sufferings that everybody suffers through. And so, in that, we all have that in common. That's that's kind of their version of the terminology. Does that help with the right, analogy yeah, that you're yeah, making? Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. You know, I, I actually didn't know that. And it's something I need to, you know, kind of dig. Sometimes I don't take enough time to just read a damn book. I need to read some more books. Hey, well, I, uh, I, I can't fucking read, so I get on YouTube. <laughs> Seriously, I'm dyslexic. Like, uh, I have Damn. huge problems reading. Well, hey, man. Ever since I was a kid, they gave me these blue glasses, and they were like, here, be socially ostracized. It'll help you. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Fuck, no. They tried really hard. They just didn't know how cruel kids were. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, you just can't fucking prepare for that. Hell, the last book I read was The Silmarillion. I don't even know what that is. What? The Silmarillion is the uh, How the Lord of the Rings Began. Gerald oh, okay. It's it's crazy. It's a crazy book. Like, the first 20 pages is like, if I remember right. Did he just come clean and go, I read Gilgamesh? <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, being told, that book's too hard, don't read it. You know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, That dude invented fucking languages. He's a fucking genius. He's not a plagiarist. Yeah. It was a joke. For those of you who yeah. feel like sending me that email, <laughs> just go ahead and get that out of the way. <laughs> that email. Uh, but yeah, in a nutshell, like the first 20 pages, man, mm. it's like, and do I remember the names and everything? No, it's been a while since I've read it. Sure. But uh, pretty much like one God birthed levels of his own consciousness, mm -hmm. and those levels of consciousness became conscious even more so. Oh, yeah. And So he read the Enuma Elish. 
I believe so. You know, and it's it's pretty crazy. I think if you got around in some way, getting your hands on the book or just listening to it, like it's really crazy. It's it's okay. the just to hear somebody's take a creative take on creating something in a in a reality. You know what I mean? <laughs> I um. Can I smoke a cigarette? Yeah, go ahead. People's create yeah creativity. Fuck yeah, man. Do you smoke cigarettes? I used to, so I'll enjoy it. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, I'm all that made me think of a Tom Waits story. You know, he's talking about the muses and uh, these old gods and mm. uh, the Enuma Elish. But no, I don't read um, because it's difficult for me. So what I like to do is hop on YouTube and uh, just listen to some crickets. Sit in the AC long yeah. enough. Let's enjoy some Pensacola sweat. Feels good out here, though. It does. It does. A nice little rain cooled everything off. But uh, so a new male leash, um, ancient texts. I don't read much. I enjoy YouTube. Like I said, I listen to books on tape, audio books. Like you ever do anything in the car as far as listening? All day long. That's awesome. Audible.com is good. Podcasts. Most so percentage, of the time. not to cut you off. Percentage. Give me a pie chart. If you're like three or four different things as far as list, like percentage of music, percentage of book listening, like. Do you listen to more books than you do anything? I listen to more podcasts. Podcasts are really fun to listen than to. Than I do anything right now. Yeah, and I listen to a nice variety. Uh, Shane Moss has one that I just got introduced to that's uh, Here We Are, which is a different scientist every week. Uh, it's great fucking stuff. He does a lot of work with uh, oh, psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, oh, man, what's well. it called? Uh, Here We Are. Here We Are. Because mm-hmm. I do like the Star Talk thing. I haven't heard that. Oh, that's uh, DeGrasse Tyson. It's really cool. Yeah, man. that's he's a good got, one. He, and he'll get some like, you know, he'll bring his Ease and Sorry on and shit like yeah. that, and you know, some comedy. Yeah, man. There's one There's comic on there. It's his co-host, and I can't remember his name. Um, the dude uh, from uh, Bob's Burgers. Uh, this, H. John Benjamin. The one that does the the, the son. Gene. Gene. That is. Uh, I can't think of his name. Yeah. It'll come to me eventually. Yeah, he's his co-host. So there's a yeah. lot of really f- and Neil's actually his laughs hilarious. So that and the Nerdist, those are the ones that I'll listen. I've to. heard that name before, the Nerdist. Uh, Another good one. They do. They got Josh Hobby out there one time. Oh yeah. And he just told the funniest fucking stories. Like, <laughs> like it, honestly, that's the funny. If if I could bump into somebody on a tour, I'd be like, please, Josh, let's hang out. That dude's funny as so. hell. Well, let's see if I had to finish that, that yeah, so breakdown. No, 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 it's okay. I like it's, so music. Um, we call music probably ten to fifteen percent of the time. Damn. And but if I'm not engaged in a conversation like this, there is at least one of those things playing in the background. Oftentimes, two. So like I'll have I'll have different meditation music on. And I'll be doing research. I'll be reading articles from the Weekly Scientific Review or something like that. Or I'll be listening to music. I'll have music on in the background, and I'll be listening to a comedian. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so I do a lot of... You know, multitasking is bullshit. You can't do two things at one time, but what I... No one can. It's just not possible. <laughs> uh, it's not how the brain it's, works. It's hard as we try but what we can do is we can switch back and forth between things really quick. And my ADHD fucking loves that shit. Yeah, same so way. I'll have a lot of things going on that I can bounce back and forth between to keep keep my little inner kittens happy. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, and chasing, chasing Some people look at you like, what the hell? It's like, oh no, I, I gotta figure it out, man. Trust me. Yeah. Well, and sometimes it's just a matter of having the interrupt. Like, uh, if I'm spinning my, my bodying balls, then... That's, I have a pair and I can't find them. Yeah, you can have mine. They're right down there. Dude. But that's just a way of saying, okay, that part of the brain needs to shut off because the mental illnesses that I have, the version of whatever spectrum I am, is shit goes really fast all the fucking time. Yeah. Sit down, hang on, keep up. But that's just the next version of humanity. That's what we've been evolved to do is fucking solve problems, recognize patterns, fucking think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am one of the versions of that that uh, just doesn't like authority. And to tie it back to what you were saying earlier, have huge anger issues. But that comes out of 
Uh, anger and fear are nearly synonymous when you break them down far and I, and enough. I like to throw con- confusion in with anger too. There you like, go. So that's fear. That that yeah. Okay, yeah, there you go. Exactly. That's that's true. And you when you break down emotions far enough, this is the fear, power, and novelty side of truth, love, and peace, is that fear is the original emotional state in that nothing exists in nature peacefully and calmly forever. It is promulgated and propagated and, and stoked and incited by survival or discomfort. And so you either have something that you have to overcome to survive mm-hmm. or you have a sight on how to survive more easily, more efficiently, better in some way, shape, or form. So like a, so, like yeah. a site, like a, uh, like a location? Like a, what do you mean? No, so fear is the, the primal state. Right, right, It right. is the primal instigator. I thought you were saying like a site, like <clears throat> to say like, you know, look, like some, like my mom broke it down to me when I was a kid. She said there's two, two types of people in this world. There's farmers and there's hunters. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so the hunters are the ones that face the fear, run out, they you know, stab at the beehive, but what the hell is this? You know, the farmer's like, oh, cool, man. Oh, like I hurt. You know? <laughs> like, just chill behind the picket fence, you know? Um, they don't do that. And that's that's a huge and that's a huge part like i i you know fear is definitely a, a perpetuator and if you want to become i don't know maybe it's too far to say a, a maybe a great human is that you know what i mean like just to be better like just to try new things do new things and push yourself i don't know i you know i have friends that i love to death i'm like come on dude like yeah so on. that's the novelty part of of the the theory so fear power and novelty just to throw right. this out there fear power and novelty came about for me as a theory of motives i set out for i want the theory of everything from a communication and philosophy standpoint and so that's fear power and novelty if anything the answer to why any person, any creature, anything ever does, anything that it ever does is one of those three things or some combination of all three of those things. Right. And that is because you have emotion, you have context, and you have control. And we all seek within our context to exercise whatever control we can. And this is born of fear. Because we fear, because we are uncomfortable, we seek novel contexts, new contexts, that are better for us, right. and we attempt in all possible ways to control that situation. Now, all of that is pure fuck fantasy illusion. Pure fuck fantasy. And uh, and that's why the ideal version of that is truth, love, and peace. Because you to be stuck on the other side and to live in that world is just manic depression. That's kind of like what fun. you were saying. You know, I mean, being on the front of a battlefield. Yeah. Than being in the back of your mind. You know? Yeah, that's, I, that's why you don't want to do that shit yeah, all the man. time. You, you got to look towards something else. You got to move towards yeah. something better. It, it's it's a really <laughs> it's a really dangerous thing. Like if you you know you could tear down your whole reality and really like kind of fuck yourself. Well, that's the idea. That's that's one of the things I think more people should do. Is the the you sh- you should on a regular basis tear it down when I was I went back to school uh, to, to get a degree when I was 26 I left the casino industry and that's I mentioned that because the psychology and, and science tells us now that the human brain doesn't finish evolving until you're about 25 26 so when I went back I was a horrible fuck student D's C's barely fucking scraped out of high school mm. my mom was terrified I wasn't gonna make it it was, a, it was a whole thing so when I turned 25 26 and go back to college as a philosopher, like full on vengeance. And in this class, this teacher looks at me and goes, what do you believe? Like ground up your homework assignment, figure out what you believe, defend that shit, rationalize that shit, and justify your existence and your beliefs. Like, oh fuck. Like you can not take that seriously and be like, I kind of believe this, I kind of believe that. But when someone says, justify your existence yeah. and your you beliefs. You kind of have to narrow it down. Yeah, you're like, holy shit, what do I believe? Yeah, man. And then you get to the thing of, all right, if I believe in a soul and I believe in reincarnation, I also believe in science. So how do I explain those two things? And that's where I think people need to put the time in and put the work in. Like, what do you believe? Yeah. You know, figure that shit out. Yeah, man. Yeah, they just kind of go with the flow. And, and like I said, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I, I'm one of those people... I'm, you know, I always like having good friends and so on, and, and you know, I, I'll I'll kind of sometimes take on, not necessarily their emotion, but you know, I, you know that 
natural care. I'm like, man, you know, you know, you try to push them and, and break them out of there. Then you're like somebody just saying like, oh man, you know, I want to, want to be a carpenter, but you know, kind of do it on the side and have great work. It's like, dude, you need to. I mean, I'm not saying go out and you know sell your soul. I'm just saying, man, like at least maybe it comes from the musical standpoint. Like I'm just used to like share this shit. Like, yeah. share it man you know philosophy music you, you're that beautiful birdhouse you made yeah. yesterday you know like that is awesome dude artwork all that and that's why I'm a big fan of the this this UBI coming down the pike I think that money has become the chains of slavery in money has become the modern chains of slavery yeah and some form of key or freedom from that to allow people to make that beautiful birdhouse instead of having to suffer through the soul-sucking fluorescence that is corporate America. Uh, it, they yeah. deserve people deserve that. Human beings deserve that that out. Just yeah, you just know. as much as a child deserves a, a great upbringing yeah. of just knowledge, information. You know, like information on life and a, and a good perspective just to get them started yeah it's the same thing like you i it's weird because i'll kind of look at him like man that's just a big ass kid who just stopped following what he loved to do you that's know? me yeah. i just i just stopped doing the authority <laughs> thing and just decided to embrace the big kid part exactly you know and and i mean it might be easy for me to say i mean i'm 25 right now sure from our perspective yeah exactly. there are other perspectives not mm -hmm. to belittle any of them, but uh, come explain yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just, you need to start up a class, man. I mean, like, come, write it down come right here. Come explain yourself. <laughs> come explain yourself. What do you believe? That's good. That's that's an intense paper to write. It's fun stuff, though, man. It's really fun stuff. That's the shit. I mean, we just shut ever. We just shut Everman's down. We did shut Everman's down. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> There's um. There's something you said in there that I wanted to get back to, and now it's gone. Gone from my mind. We've covered so much good stuff, though, man. Yeah, we this just kind of went off this on This has been beautiful. I like the tangents, though. Like, I was getting ready to go further down the rabbit hole. I'm that guy. And dude. here it is. I finally got back to it. So we talk about all these things. This is one of the reasons that I'm, if I have my own business, it'll be in Florida and not Alabama. Because psilocybin is quick on the heels of cannabis to be legalized and I wholeheartedly believe that the revolution has begun in that anger and the contemptuous nature of our culture which is desperately crying out for help mm -hmm. which is evidenced by the suicide rates and other atrocities that we suffer on a daily basis right. that that we can do better, and in our, I think our country wants to do better. And getting away from alcohol and moving more into uh, plant-based recreations than uh, than than big pharma, right? You know, chemical, you know, f manufactured chemicals uh, is going to be hugely influential because those things help sedate anger and uh, and push down all of the negative tendencies yeah. that I think a lot of our just residual I mean cuz yeah that's self needs to get rid of. I mean that is I mean it's really fucked up when you step back and you look like I can go to this place and get something that destroys my liver and potentially makes me an asshole and whatever like whatever else might come up you know how it is people get drunk they change that whether it's a true inner self whatever they're struggling with just boom Mm. What if you could just go to the bar and you're just like, let me do a little tiny shot, just like a small shot of like uh, <laughs> psilocybin and, and some like lemonade or something? You're just like, just give me, just give me that little shot. And you're yeah. Just like at the bar, it's like, yeah, fuck right. This right? Is right, man. <laughs> like that would be so crazy. I need a shitty day at work. I had a shitty day at work. I'd like one shitty day at work shot, please. <laughs> like. All the way up to smoked DMT, which is just on the menu, worst day ever. <laughs> I need to disappear. Right, right? I need, I need 15 minutes of the worst day ever, I remedy. I need to kaleidoscope Please. my way out of this right now. <laughs> 
It, but it's coming down the pike. Guys like Rick Dyblin, who is uh, an MD, Johns Hopkins trained doctor, has gotten MDMA to phase three clinical trials uh, mm -hmm. in human beings. They're doing uh, psychotherapy assisted. That's one thing I've, I've I've always heard. So he's told me that like a few friends of mine told me that like if you can get your hands on beautiful pure MDMA, it's one of the most. Oh, it's awesome. I, I gotta say, I've never I've never. Psilocybin's easier, and they're they're. I don't trust people, so chemists, yeah. fuck them. They could screw. I don't. I don't need some chemist I've never met screwing up my life. <laughs> because they they mix something wrong they had a and shit I get day to work right and I got to walk around with that shit for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, that's hugely common. What is your right eye closed? It's like, look, man. Because Fred, Fred didn't know plan. how to carry the two. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what well, man? I, I, could you put that on a shirt or something? That I would wear the fuck out of that shirt, dude. That's so funny. Because Fred couldn't carry the fucking two. That's why, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write that bit tonight when I get home. <laughs> Please, it's funny. That could be used a lot. That's great. Oh, because Fred didn't carry the two. <laughs> 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 now I just want to write a bunch of comedy bits around Fred and his not two carrying ass. Just have a T-shirt of Fred. <laughs> Fred, you asshole. The two. Yeah, dude. Whoever that's... Fred is, oh, a trail of twos behind him. And it's great. It's so great coming up with little slang shit like that, like. What was it? Uh, my buddy and I came up with tight nooks and fat crannies. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one immediately. <laughs> tight tight nooks. nooks and fat crannies. And dude, it was just like we were the house. Oh. We were cleaning. We were cleaning. And he was like, just look at the, just make sure all the, you know, the tight nooks or whatever. <laughs> so I just said tight nooks, fat crannies. And it was oh, perfect, God. dude. That sounds like it needs to be like a weed food dispensary. Yeah. Tight nooks, fat crannies. What are some other ones that I've been using? Oh, yeah. Well, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I definitely want to be on the front lines of, of what psychedelics are, are going to do for people. Because I think, you know, in the cycles of time, the 60s came and went, uh, you know, with the hippies and the, the peace, love, revolution, and all that good stuff. Uh, that wave rolled back because it was before its time there was no means of disseminating enough information mm -hmm. to overcome right. the, the commonly held beliefs. They, just, they could only get so far. But now, in the day and age of social media, and things like Tahrir Square, which I got wrong on a previous podcast, but remembered eventually in Egypt, um, and the Arab Spring, which is this westward rolling of falling and usurping of dictatorships and shitty governments, which, right. you know, we're in the process of becoming a shitty government. We are a shitty corporate government, depending on how far you want to look into yeah. it. Yeah, right. uh, and so eventually that will topple, and we're seeing it in other parts of the world. History dictates it's fucking cyclical. Everything's cyclical. Mm -hmm. And so now we are on the precipice of can we get through these these imaginary walls, like the walls that separate us from DMT, yeah. the walls that separate us from psilocybin, this, then all this fucking anger and competition. That's the the name of our version of history is going to be uh, the competitive age. And one yeah. day, some kids are going to look <laughs> back and be like, look, this is just one big pissing contest. Look at them. Yeah. Polishing their big blue dicks over Pensacola. Exactly, dude. Mm. That might get me in trouble. Hey, let's see if anybody even catches it. <laughs> <laughs> my buddy, uh, my buddy does a podcast. If you're interested, it's called uh, Jonestown. Good morning, Jonestown. Good morning, Jonestown. Yeah, and it's hilarious, oh. dude. Uh, because you're it. a big Blues Angels fan, you should check out their new episode about the Blues Angels. Keep in mind, it's a comedy podcast. Don't send me that email bummer. either. It's entertainment. Money. Deal with it. <laughs> if you can't deal with it, don't come down. Mon what, wait, when is the thing at the back porch? He's oh, those are on uh, open mics are on Tuesday. Tuesday. They do a show every Friday night, though, and they're fucking rock. Tony Burkett uh, and all the, the folks at Back Porch Comedy, Olivia Searcy, Jason Switzer, uh, Zach Van Gestel. Fucking awesome. Cool, cool people. That's where I got my start, so I owe them my entire comedy career. I just need to go in there and have a beer. Yeah, man. That's what I need to do. It's fucking awesome. Fucking awesome. I'm loving the comedy scene. And I tell you, I get to host three comedy open mics a week. It's 
fucking unheard of, man. That's great. Unheard of. Well, I've barely Barbie's been doing it. a nice little comedy scene. Yeah? yeah. I think they're, it's coming back. My buddy uh, Mark Labarge is uh, is down that way. And I think, I think uh, I know his Mos- name. Mossies? Moses? Moses. Moses, yeah. They got a show. There's some people doing doing comedy down there now. Oh, shit. Okay. It's one of the ones I want to look into and check out. Um, yeah, I mean, if dude, that time. was... When I was, like, 18, they were... They, it was, like, a whole town was littered with... Uh, spoken word and comedy and then it just kind of died out and then the comedy came back and uh, every Monday this place called the Green Door it was it was packed I don't know I guess the dude who was running it left or did something like not in a negative light I think he just moved or whatever um, but it just kind of trickled out but there was one point man it was, it was thick in there every Monday I want and to that's grow awesome. Yeah, hell yeah. I want to grow the comedy scene on the Gulf Coast back to that. Like, there have been a lot of people working on it for a long time, doing great fucking work, and I, I want to help. Chizuko does comedy, doesn't Yeah, it? Back Porch Comedy is... Uh, Olivia Searcy runs that show. She's one of the co-founders of Back Porch Comedy, and uh, they do... I think it's the third Sunday of every month. She's fucking awesome. She's come out to Orange Beach and done the Stingers Comedy Show, which is my show with Emily Dillon. We're at the Flying Harpoon 2, third Saturday of every month, mm-hmm. and... Um, yeah, Olivia's come out, Tony's come out, like I said, both co-founders of, uh, of Back Porch Comedy, and fucking great. Shizuka's a great place. Great, great place. Yeah, that's a really good... Cool, no, I love that spot. I was just at a comedy show there the other day. How was it? Yeah, yeah. fucking awesome. <laughs> fucking yeah. awesome. Good shit. Yeah, La- I can't remember Lauren's last name from New Orleans, but uh, they came over, put on a great show. So doing more stuff like that, uh, I'm stoked about, and I want to do more of it, because I'm... On one hand, I'm a little terrified that people will show up with tiki torches and not understand that jokes are funny, and if you can't laugh at yourself, then you're kind of missing the point and are probably deserved to be the butt of a joke. Yeah. And I mean, and places or, like Chizuko would be the place to do it, you know? Yeah. There's a lot yeah. More, I mean, yeah, you know, it's just like with anything, man. You, you got to go with the hip crowd, you know what I mean? Like, in a certain way. Well, I'd love to have my, like, a, com- a standalone comedy club down here. I'd love to help the scene. And even Dude, if it's not mine, if it's somebody. It'd be awesome. You know what's perfect for that? Over there near Shizuko, that whole little downtown thing that's like, it just seems, I mean, they're probably, I don't know if there's open buildings down there, but that that is such a cool little square. Yeah. You know, with Blue, uh, was it um, Five Sisters Blues Cafe at Shizuko? I didn't know until like we played that show at Chizuko that there was a a bar on the other side. Like I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. It, like I don't even know what it's called. Um, but I guess on the opposite side of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that would be cool, man. I, that's just like I like I like little hip spots like that. That's, that'd be tight. Yeah, I think. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Bunch Over, of like, fun. Get you a warehouse or something like where you just got the vibes right. Like um, there's this thing with me. Uh, I say with music. I, to say as far as like performing like there's this uh you know they have collectives and shit like that so like um boiler room you ever heard of boiler room it's, yes there's only a few places where they really do it and one of them's you know they do a couple i think in uh like europe and shit and they have them over here but it's just you go in there the intent it's like i was talking to my buddy like take make more spots where it's like take away the intent to just sit at home with bullshit it's like well you just go to this spot and bullshit if you want there you know whether there is a show going on or whether you just sit in the corner playing 64 or listen to some record or whatever the hell but that whole boiler room theory is just like come up show up vibe just vibe i like that you know what i mean like as as vague as that sounds like well i mean what do you mean by vibe it's like i just mean you are getting human beings together who understand how important it is just to experience something together yeah like okay so back in the day in turkey it was the coffee house Mm-hmm. The pu- and in Ireland, it's the pub, you know. In Scotland, wherever you want to go, there are these these the public house. Like the reason it's called a pub is because public house. It's a gathering place, a meeting place. Whatever drug you want to put with it, because caffeine, hookah, all different alcohol, all drugs that have this communal thing that that or they just get thrown on top of these communal things. Right. So. Just having that communal place sounds fucking awesome. I'm totally on board with that. Because, I mean, yeah, there are... You go to a town, you go to the bar, whatever, but, like, I'm sure as hell you don't go to Wild Greg's to get a vibe. Right. You know what I mean? Unless the vibe is, let's see, when and who goes to jail. 
That's it. Who's, get, who, who's many, getting maced tonight? How many fights can I count? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, uh, but dickheads. I, you know, like whether, but even if it's somebody's house, man. You know what I mean? Like having a having a setup like that. Like that's and that's the beauty of a boiler. Like the boiler rooms. They're like either in a warehouse or not at a home. You know, like there's one boiler room set I watched. It was like all in this dude's massive like record collection room. Cool. And there's just like 20 people in there just drinking PBR or vibing. You know, <laughs> that's cool. Like, I don't know. If you can't eat an elephant whole, man, take it in chunks. And, you know, that being said with something like presenting a, a product or just not fuck, fuck a product. I just mean a standpoint, mm-hmm. you know. Perspective. Yeah. Come enjoy our exactly, lens. Exactly, dude. Perspective is a huge word in my life. Agreed. My perspective on this buffet, it's it's great. That's what. <laughs> Making me hungry. Making me hungry, Joe. Tight nooks and fat crannies. Man. That's all I'm <laughs> Tight nooks and fat crannies. That's gonna be the name of this episode. <laughs> Tight nooks and fat crannies. <laughs> I think we're gonna leave it right there. We're gonna leave it on tight nooks and fat crannies. So thanks for joining us. Bye, you.